Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, you uh, may have, have noticed that our sermon title, perhaps a bit unfortunately, is Beaten But Blessed. Now, now to be clear, I made this title before I even realized it was Super Bowl Sunday or that the Bengals were in the Super Bowl. It's not meant to be a Super Bowl prediction. Um, so don't worry, you don't have to defrock me. I'm, I'm pulling for the Bengals. And, uh, and so are my kids. And, um, and as of right now, my remote is not working early, so I might have to have you do the slides. So if you connect to the next slide, it's, it says I'm connecting. So there we go. See, here's proof. My kids are, are cheering for the Bengals all week long, every, week, every day of the week. They had, their, they had a different thing they were supposed to dress up like Monday was Joe Burrow Cool, Joe cool Day or something, and they were supposed to wear bling and sunglasses. Every, every day I had something different. Um, and it's kind of cool living in, I've never, I've never been living in a city with a professional sports team in a championship game. I think uh, my favorite professional teams have never done that since I became aware of sports. And sports certainly is a, a big part of a, our culture. And if you don't know, I thoroughly enjoy playing watching and coaching sports. However, it's also true that our, our love of sports can get out of whack. Like anything else, any, even the good things, things can get distorted. And, and not only can sports sometimes take up an inordinate amount of our energy, a desire to succeed or win at all costs can truly be toxic. We can begin to dehumanize others. We see other human, and this happens not just in sports, but just in life, whenever that's our, our attitude that we want to win at all costs. We begin to see other human beings around us as just something that either is getting in my way or a tool to be used to get my way. It doesn't take a, a sports fanatic to adopt that sort of attitude, but um, sports can be... A, an opportunity to deal with bo both joys and frustrations in this life. Um, all right. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I see a lot of sports, so I see sometimes when it's being done well, and sometimes I see when it's not done in a very healthy manner. And, and I go to my kids' sporting events, and unfortunately, sometimes I'm frustrated not so much with the refs, with the parents who are hollering and cursing at the refs, and frankly, their calls aren't even that bad. Um, but they're not really teaching their kids. They're not taking advantage of that opportunity to some of the, the fans. To, they're not teaching kids to deal with frustrations. Instead, they're teaching them to blame someone else instead of dealing with disappointment. To be honest, I'm not always super proud of how uh, different teams I've coaches I've coached have handled that either, and uh, how, how well or poorly I've steered the ship in regard to sportsmanship. While I'm a, a sports nut, I can see that in America, sports is sometimes an idol. Sports can be a great tool, but we certainly have to remember it's no savior. It's not the most important or most integral part of our life now, maybe not to you, but to me. Sometimes sports is one of the most exciting parts of my life, but I have to remember that just because it's exciting doesn't mean it's the most important. And even when we get frustrated by sports, it doesn't give us a legitimate excuse to, to say, you know, treat our family like the opposite team. Sports is a great excuse, a wonderful excuse to use, to get together, to have fun, and even party. Um, but just because there's a Super Bowl doesn't mean it's okay for us to get smashed and wreck our lives or our livers. And whether the Bengals win or lose, please don't riot. Um, foot, it, sports, like a lot of things, again, can be taken uh, out, of, out of proportion. And um, football players, as we talk about sports, it's important in any sport, but certainly in football 
to be under control, because if you're not under control, you'll find that you're quickly out of position, and that will give the other team an advantage. Football players, maybe you don't know this, but uh, great football players are not just strong or athletic. They know what they're supposed to do, and they're disciplined, and, and they take care of, of their job, like much of life. Uh, the New Testament, likewise, encourages us to be under control. And unfortunately, when we feel like we're losing, whether it be in sports or in work or in life, it sometimes can turn into a, an excuse to engage in unhealthy and sinful behaviors. And when we get frustrated, sometimes we self-medicate with screens or pleasure or booze, and that can in turn, um, beyond just you know, the, the potential dangers in those things, really the real concern is it gets us out of position, you might say, in, in life, but more importantly in our walk with Christ. And so just like football players, we need discipline because uh, we need to remember what's truly the most important things. And Christians also, again, this is kind of tied into the sports theme too because you, you may find good players on lower levels, but, but at the vast majority of, of excellent players in, in any sport, just like excellent best uh, workers, often make lots of sacrifices to be excellent. And Jesus is, encourages us, well, in, in fact, he tells us that we also as Christians will make sacrifices in this life. Jesus is preparing us to at least um, be treated like to, that, to be prepared for uh, times when we will be, you might say, beaten. The good news for us as Christians is that it's not about winning at all costs, particularly not winning in this life. Matter of fact, Jesus says that we will lose before we win. In the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus teaches us to have a whole new lens through which we see the world. Um, I need glasses. You probably can see that because my vision is poor. And like anybody who's got a little bit of poor vision, that means I can't see things super clearly without some help. Well, Jesus tells us that the whole world really needs a new pair of glasses. And in a, a rather fundamental way, the way we th see things, the way the whole world values things, they are out of out of focus with, with, what, with what is truly most important. What the world sees, what the world often sees as winning is just sinning. But God's kingdom is not about winning versus losing. It's rather about reconciliation instead of condemnation or alienation. In it's a contrast in some ways of God's kingdom with our um, hyper-competitive, uh, win-at-all-costs culture. And that brings us again to our, uh, the Sermon on the Plain, which is um, a new way uh, of seeing the world. We fast-forwarded to, to chapter 6 in, in the book of Luke, and, and we've skipped a, a few verses. Luke, Jesus has healed uh, a variety of um, people, Often on, often on the Sabbath. And seem, in fact, it, it almost seems like he's doing it on purpose because Jesus' healing on the Sabbath is exactly the sort of rest, which remember, Sabbath is about rest, is exactly the sort of rest Yahweh created the Sabbath for in the first place. But the Pharisees and the scribes, they don't see it that way. In fact, they are offended and upset that Jesus is healing on the Sabbath day because they interpret this as work, and so therefore a no-no. So they repeatedly challenge Jesus. But as we read Luke's gospel, we see that their vision is blurred. If only they had the eyes to see, Yahweh is actually at work in the most powerful way ever. But the Pharisees are so obsessed with their self-righteousness that they are actually hindering God's righteousness. They're in danger of entirely missing God's coming kingdom, and Jesus tries to help them see. Instead, though, they plot against him. And since so many of the established 
religious leaders are not following Jesus, who is going to? Well, er, immediately preceding this lesson, Jesus had gone up to a mountain, and, and he prayed all night. And then, after doing that, he came down and he named his 12 apostles. So the Pharisees might not follow Jesus, but the disciples, who don't really seem particularly remarkable, they will follow Jesus. Now, I, I imagine you've probably heard, well, we, we've talked about, and it's, it's more common to talk about the Sermon on the Mount, um, but the first thing, this section of teaching, which is, this is, again, is immediately following Jesus calling his disciples. He comes down to the mountain, and he starts teaching these new disciples the Sermon on the Plain, it's sometimes called, because it says he comes to a level place. And it's a lot like the Sermon on the Mount in many ways, it, and it really, for the first time in Luke's Gospel, gets to the heart of Jesus' message. We've been reading a lot about the things that Jesus does and snippets of what he says, but here we get more of the heart of the message. And it highlights particularly trust in God's plan, which means, which will always mean some degree of, of waiting and often suffering. Because these statements are, are blessings, but they are also sort of warnings. In, in the Sermon on the Plain, in fact, everything seems kind of upside down or, or topsy-turvy. God calls the poor blessed, but he says the rich are in trouble. Those who hunger now will be satisfied later, but those who are full will later be in want. Those who are hated will be loved, and those who are the most well-loved will be exposed as fakers. And this section highlights what we might refer to, and some people do, as the great reversal. Because again, this is a reminder that the way that the world sees things is warped. What the world sees as most important is often not, in, not that important at all. And what the world often sees as winning is sometimes just sinning. Earning the rewards of this life, it's really not that important. In fact, Jesus here and elsewhere in the New Testament elsewhere reminds us that sometimes those things can actually get in the way and hinder our relationship. They may not be bad in and of themselves, but, are, but, but they are nonetheless dangerous and our hearts make them dangerous. Um, we, uh, and uh, this is, again, uh, the, the Sermon on the Plain and the Sermon on the Mountain, Jesus is teaching. This is some of the, the more difficult stuff. And you might think this is, seems like an awkward time for Jesus to talk about, just like it might be an awkward time to talk about losing on Super Bowl Sunday when the Bengals are there. Um, but Jesus, this is right after Jesus is, seems to be winning, you might say, uh, when he comes out and gives this caution. Uh, because he's just called the disciples, he's, just, he's in a crowd, and it says people from all over have come to see him, and everyone just wants to touch him because power is coming out of him. In, in almost every imaginable way, it looks like Jesus is winning right now. But that's exactly when he wants to make sure to warn his disciples about what is truly most important, because um, this, what's going on in Jesus right now, is Jesus knows it's not sustainable, you might say. It's not how it's always going to be. Um, and so he prepares them uh, for what's coming down the pipe. Um, well, uh, one thing, we, as I said, we need this kind of proper way, the right lens to look at the world through because you can't find it. You can't find a, a healthy way to view the world simply from popular culture. You can't find it even just by looking within yourself. We need our Savior to, to give us the right set of glasses. Uh, and in Luke's Gospel and in the New Testament, we find that this new kingdom centers on loyalty to Jesus, who has already demonstrated his loyalty and love to us. Now, loyalty is something that fans can appreciate, especially uh, fans like Bengals fans who have been waiting for years, and now finally that loyalty has been rewarded. And um, the more you have been loyal to the Bengals, 
probably the more rewarding their success is. If, if you've hung in there uh, for the past 30 years and still at least occasionally root for the Bengals, it probably feels pretty good. Um, if uh, the experience is, is that much better when, you're, when you have some loyalty. Well, with sports teams, loyalty, uh, oh, I jumped ahead a couple, I don't know what I did, thank you. Um, uh, with, with sports team, loyalty is not always rewarded, um, but uh, our savior promises that loyalty to him will be rewarded. Um, you know, some, sometimes, Life following the, the Reds or the Bengals, you uh, Reds and Bengals fans can attest to, can be disheartening. However, Jesus promises us that eventually commitment to him will not lead to disappointment, but to rejoicing. In the end, he tells us repeatedly that we will not regret following him. Instead, we will be vindicated for placing our lives in his hands. Sometimes following Jesus does not immediately lead to a better life. In fact, it can often, as Jesus warns, even lead to hardships and persecutions. And uh, it can, in fact, be a sad, hungry, unsatisfying world at times. But it's a good thing when we feel that, in a sense. It uh, reminds us that this life uh, cannot offer us everything. Sometimes it may be more dangerous when we're getting everything we want, because then we begin to fall into the trap that this world can fully and finally satisfy me, that I can find my identity in this world, that I can find my hope in the things that are happening in this world. Um, when we experience lack, one of the silver linings of that cloud can be that we acknowledge our need for help and for our Savior. Um, sometimes it does feel like we are not winning Instead, we feel beaten. When we, for instance, choose not to respond to bitterness with more of the same, we might get mocked as weak. When we don't have all uh, the nicest things, we might not look as important to others. When we're faithful to proclaim the emptiness of this world and its victories, the world sometimes gets offended or angry. However, Jesus blesses us. He's always with us when we experience hurt and heartache. It may feel like we're hungering without being satisfied. It may feel like we're mourning with, without comfort. We may be insulted, and yet we have Jesus. And simply having Jesus with us is a victory and a blessing in and of itself. Because we are not aiming for what the world calls winning. Sure, we, you know, we, we try our best at, in all the different areas of our life. We try to do what's right. We want to be good at the different things we do. But that's only a part of life, and it's not the most important part. We are here, rather, for a new way of life in Christ, for new uh, relationships and connections and, and promises and values. We're looking for complete healing, not just of ourselves, but, but of the world, in fact. And we're focused not on what looks good on the outside, but upon Jesus, and we follow his lead. And as we remember Jesus, we know that he was quite correct, both in his assessment of what would happen to him and to struggles that, that fellow Christians and we ourselves sometimes had. But we remember that Jesus himself, he had no home, right? He thirsted, for instance, for water on the cross, but he didn't get it. He only got bitter vinegar. He cried out to God as he was left upon the cross. He was not only insulted and persecuted, he was crucified. Yet God did not abandon him, but made him Lord over all creation. As Paul said in our epistle reading, reading if, uh, if Christ has not been raised, then we are to be pitied more than all people, but in fact... Christ has been raised. He was beaten, but through his death, he's won us life. And now uh, we are with him. In fact, that is the greatest blessing. I said earlier that uh, simply having Jesus is a blessing in and of itself. Well, now we truly are with him. God has 
in a variety of ways, including our baptism, where it says this explicitly in the scriptures, God has lumped us together with Jesus, not only in his suffering, but also in his resurrection. And now uh, we simply await. Uh, we await our, our Lord's return when he will restore, heal, and fix this broken world by his great power and sacrificial love. In Jesus' name, amen.